Hi everyone and welcome to another update. There was some really interesting news this week and actually the last few days. Clarity Pharmaceuticals announced a complete response in somebody with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So this is the first patient to get two cycles of their copper 67 uh, bis PSMA. And six months after the second dose, there was no evidence of PSA. Effectively, the patient had been cured. Now, this was particularly interesting because this participant was heavily pretreated. So it says metastatic castration resistance. So you can assume that they've gone through those earlier treatment therapies, but also adrenergic deprivation therapy, androgen receptor pathway inhibitors, chemotherapy. These are all treatments with very serious side effects. Um, and typically, if you've gone through that entire treatment pathway, things have just got worse and worse and worse, and you haven't responded to any prior therapy or have relapsed, which allows you to go into these trials. To effectively cure somebody who has failed all these lines of treatment is a pretty phenomenal result. They got their first treatment, PSA, prostate-specific antigen, went down. There was a little bit of a reading. They did another cycle, and then for six months it was undetectable. And you see the legions completely disappeared. So it's a pretty phenomenal result. And it's worth noting, the interesting thing about this trial is that basically they've been releasing data as each cohort progresses. So they're now in the fourth cohort. They're still in dose escalation phase, effectively a phase one. And this is really the key trial for clarity because by the end of this, they'll have tried higher doses, they'll have treated a large number of patients. All these patients will be kind of at the end of the line of all existing approved treatments. And to see the results they're getting is truly spectacular. Now, the reason it's interesting commercially, other than obviously that the market sizing is six billion plus for an effective prostate cancer treatment, there's been a very lively M&A. So it's broadly recognized that we do need better treatments for prostate cancer and other cancers. And radio pharmaceuticals have very few side effects compared to castrating somebody physically and chemically. And that's why the Big Pharma is so excited and there have been so many acquisitions. And these acquisitions have kind of been happening in the 3 billion US plus uh, with less data or worse data than Clarity's. And Clarity's probably trading at about 650 million US. It's certainly nice to see directors actually buying stock with cash. You know, The typical genesis of a lot of biotech companies is they get their hands on an asset, either a repurposed drug or a spin out from university and then raise a lot of money out of it and withdraw a lot of money through salary options and payments. It's very interesting when you see money going the other way from the directors and insiders back into the company and it's a really strong signal. After their cap raise, they've got a lot of cash as well now, so their destiny is truly in their hands. 150 million Aussie is quite a lot for a, an Australian company and more than enough to get them significant data reader. It's not in just in this treatment trial, but in their other trials. But it's really this secure study that is the most meaningful. This is the one if they do well, they're well on track to that really bull case outcome, which is another three to five X from where we are today. Interestingly, it actually listed in $1.50, so you can really see how red hot the market for this stuff was in 2021. Most of the data that I'm so excited about and has got the market so excited has come out since then. So you'd have to be very prescient or very lucky to kind of predict that that would do so well. Certainly, even just seeing these results, these effective cures, uh, is not something I don't think you would have predicted. That obviously, insiders would have had pretty strong conviction on it, uh, to bet their careers on it. You can also note it's breaking out to a new high. And we're kind of in a six-week sell-off in markets. So that's very powerful relative strength. And this was a very well-supported raise as well. As they keep releasing this patient data, we're just going to be more and more convicted on what the outcome of this total trial will be. You know, for this trial to fail now, you'd really need everything that we've seen just not to happen in the final patients. But it's increasingly unlikely as each patient data is released. The other interesting one was Curvebeam AI. So Curvebeam has been a bit of a journey. I mean, we invested in our VC fund at 32 cents and IPO at 48 cents, and then it dropped to 17. The scare happened last quarter when they got very few sales from Strikers reps. So this is the end of last year. Now, we spoke to three reps on the ground to try and get a feel for what they were thinking. And actually, they were really positive. They kind of said that the surgeons were all aware of it. It was widely discussed. Everyone was deciding whether or not to buy a device. It was widely anticipated. Each of them thought that they could get at least one to two sales a year themselves, which would give 50 devices a year, which would be on an average 400 US 
device costs something like 20 mil US versus a you know, 30 mil US market cap company, which would give pretty strong returns from here. But the end of last year was weak, but we kind of knew it because the reps were all telling us that the first sales they would get would be the beginning of this year. And it was really throughout 2024 that sales would ramp up. So it's a bit of a relief, to be honest, to see them come out with six device sales. But most importantly, orders for five devices so far this quarter. So after one month, because this was released at the end of April, in one month they had five devices. So it's actually on a annual run rate of 60 at the moment. We'll just have to see if that rate of purchase orders is maintained throughout the quarter, but it's really encouraging. You know, that's kind of like our bull case. The company said that one of the things that was holding them back was that the surgeons wanted hip and knee as well as ankle, whereas it's kind of foot and ankle is what the device is approved for now. So the company is doing work to prove that out. You can see that data here. You know, the first total knee replacement surgery was planned and completed using scans uh, in the quarter, and they've been doing all these cadaver tests as well. So that should be broadly completed this year by the beginning of next year. The bull case also depends on this bone mineral density scan, which is like a software module that can be done with the existing advice. That's kind of to mid-2025. So the company's been investing pretty heavily. If sales take longer to arrive, they're potentially too heavily, but they've hired a lot of developers. They're developing this product. The revenues for that won't come for over another year. The key thing here is they need to increase the install base. It's really important they get those five sales a month or at least, you know, six sales a quarter, which is the run rate they're on now because the larger the installed base, the more revenue they'll get when they roll out these software updates. One thing to be aware of, though, is they are kind of a bit cash constrained. So unlike Clarity, they've only got about 11.8 mil. And they're saying that this will last them to September 2023. That will assume that they'll make a lot of sales and probably continue to cut costs. But this is a company that will have to raise money at some point, unless, you know, the current monthly order rate continues and everything develops on track. But maybe it's too much to hope for everything to go to go right. So I think that's probably a bit of weakness in the stock. I think it's also one of those IPOs that are listed at 48. It's now trading at 17. There'll be a lot of small shareholders who just see that as a loss and happy to move on. Um, and really, they do kind of need another quarter. If they can... If they can report this quarter, then we'll be excited and would be would probably be buying. But we'll just have to see. The company has a lot to prove. The other company that reported last night, the third life sciences one, was Transmedics. We've been saying for a, num- for a long time is one of our top picks. So Transmedics and Clarity are actually our two biggest individual stock exposures. And they announced you know, a 133% increase compared to the first quarter of last year. But most interestingly, they generated $12 million of gap net income. So 12 million of gap neck income for the quarter on 97 mil, whilst growing at 133%. So when you're investing in growth stocks, usually it's kind of the opposite. Like when you see those numbers like 133%, they're usually accompanied by very heavy gap losses. Sometimes cash flow, but huge amounts of stock dilution or something, Mm -hmm. certainly gap losses. So to increase profitability by so much and actually show a decent 12% margin really just shows the power of this platform and the value it's adding and their pricing power. I mean, you can kind of see when you look at the financials, you know, there's that 133% increase in revenue and costs only increased by about 50%. So 133% increase in top line, 50% increase in costs, big increase in net income from an 8% loss to a 12% profit. So a 20% turnaround in, in net income margin. Very impressive. You can also see here like the this number of stocks basically hasn't changed. So it's growing far faster than most stocks, most loss making growth stocks. Um, and it's not really diluting at all, which is impressive. If you look at their income statement, you'll notice that their interest expense and their interest income are roughly equal. They did quite a large convertible note issuance. They've got 448 mil of debt. Now, the reason people do these things is because they basically give up a bit of equity upside, effectively selling a call option uh, and dramatically reducing the interest rate on that debt. And you can see also on their balance sheet, they've still got most of it. So there's 350 mil of cash there and 447 mil of debt. The reason people do it is obviously it doesn't necessarily improve your equity position, but it does give you a lot of liquidity and a lot of flexibility and funding power. Even if you just issue the notes at very little, give up a little upside and then give yourself a large amount of cash. Uh, So that's encouraging. You know, this is gap profitable by a 12% margin. So it's definitely, you know, well past that death zone where companies are growing but losing money and just have to hope that they land somewhere profitable. The other thing that's kind of working in Transmedics is, you know, when it was released, I'm assuming people listening to this have been following what we've been doing for a while. 
basically they transplant organs in these machines um, and keep them warm, monitor their vital signals, and this is assumed to be superior than putting the organs in a bucket of ice, which is effectively what's done now. But that's been hard to prove. You know, it's not easy to conduct a trial. You can't, you literally can't do a double blind trial um, because it's very obvious which organ is on a machine and which is in the bucket. Uh, and also every organ is kind of different. Every situation is different. The different times, the journey traveling is different. Very hard to prove, but you're definitely starting to see that. Um, so you can see one researcher here found the overall cost was favorable. So the 100000 US roughly that they charge versus very little for an ice bucket. It actually comes out to more favorable when you count in, you know, discarded organs and all the issues that come with the standard of care. And so that kind of makes sense. If you think about what happens, um, typically a junior surgeon will get in a plane, go to the hospital where the organ is, retrieve the organ, bring it back, and then the senior surgeon will make the call as to whether they're going to go ahead. And that's a key moment because once they choose to go ahead, they're putting an organ in a patient, taking out an existing organ. It's very, you can't really go back from that. Uh, if anything goes wrong, it's disastrous. And the surgeon has to basically make that call based on what they see. At least with Transmedics device, you've actually been monitoring the organ throughout that period, and you have much better read and more data to make that call. So that's kind of what this research is referring to there. You can also see reference to studies that show they can transport organs, you know, these hearts double the distance and have similar outcomes. You can also see here there was like a significant reduction in severe primary graft dysfunction, which is the most severe early post-heart transplant complication associated with the worst survival. Uh, so they're really building out that evidence base that shows this is cost-effective um, and leads to better outcomes or at least equivalent outcomes, but certainly with a much um, longer travel time which goes to the part of the bull case, which is they actually managed to expand the market. Because organs can survive longer and they've got their own logistics now to transport them, the idea is you can actually increase the number of organs that are successfully transplanted. And obviously, you know, the demand for organs is way in excess of what can actually be delivered. So this is quite interesting. You can see it's been a volatile stock, though. I mean, we bought it, ripped 50%. It went from 90 to like 37 last year, which is painful. Um, this is kind of before we're applying these risk models across our portfolio. Um, but in the pre-market, it's up 15%. And this is in the context of a biotech sell-off. Since markets peaked in February, there's been a pretty broad-based sell-off uh, as interest rates in the United States have turned back upwards. So it's great to see our two largest healthcare positions, actually our two largest positions, Clarity and Transmedics, kind of bucking that trend. You can kind of see it's been a very wild ride for this stock, but the returns have been there. You know, we've talked about how we apply models, like these risk models. So I thought Transmedics is a good example of one. So if you apply this risk model, you got 36% a year, 4.6 times return, but your drawdown was only 36%. Um, you actually did better if you just held a stock. You did 5.4 times, so a little bit better, 5.4 versus 4.6. But your drawdown was 74%. And this is in the context of a very successful um, company. Uh, and you can see the difference in volatility. If you're on the podcast, you won't be able to see. But if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see the difference in return profile and volatility of the two different approaches to the same stock. So we are systematically applying this across our portfolio. And I think it's really exciting and it's pretty unique as well, applying this kind of thing to a fundamental stock selection and growth stocks. As far as I'm aware, no one's really doing this. Certainly no fund. Uh, the other company, the fourth company that reported was AMD. So they had astonishing revenue declines. So in this quarter, gaming revenue declined 48% year on year and 33% sequentially. So 33% below where it was, you know, last quarter. Their embedded segment, which is kind of like selling to um, companies, revenue decreased 46% and 20% on the quarter. Big falls. So their AI stuff is going great. It's growing 80%, not as fast as NVIDIA, but still growing 80%. But net out those big losses, and actually it's only up 2% year on year, um, which really kind of emphasizes how important it is to stick with the winners. You know, we wrote, we wrote and talked about how we were actually selling AMD because it was more expensive than NVIDIA, and it was a number two. Um, and I feel like, you know, we all have our biases. My bias is definitely to kind of go for the cheaper number two at all times. And I really have to fight that. You know, the number one's the going to fall less it's going to make more money it's going to price higher and it's probably going to rally more and it's exactly what you saw with nvidia the other thing that struck me about md's results is not really making any money which you know is surprising so non-gap 
it's making a billion, but gap quarterly income, 123 million. That's not a large number for a very large company. I really think this was a pretty weak result. And I'm not surprised, you know, it's kind of sold off the way it did. So it's gone, it had a ripping run, basically doubled and then has dropped about 25% um, from the highs in March. And that's kind of coincided with highs in a lot of these growth stocks. So I think you're seeing a very strong divergence between the ones that are performing, like Transmedics, and then the ones that are coming out with weaker results, like AMD. Um, and I think that's just the way this market is going to be. There's still lots of money to be made. There's still great companies. But we're not getting those big swings up and swings down. It's very differentiated. Really good for stock picking and also really good for these kind of quantitative approaches, which make sure you're out of stocks when they're kind of trending down. But I also wanted to compare it to NVIDIA, and you can see this is what it looks like. I mean, sadly, this particular chart is also non-GAAP, but GAAP and non-GAAP in NVIDIA isn't such a big difference. But you can see, you know, like, forget 2%. This is went from $26.7 billion to $61 billion in revenue and you know 9 billion of um, operating income to 37 billion of non-gap operating income so that is what performance likes and let's compare that to these numbers you know 5 bill revenue to 5 bill 5.3 to 5.5 um, net income 139 million lost to 123 million profit like this is not the kind of numbers that you want to see uh, and it really emphasizes again that you want to stay in this game with the number one I also thought I'd show what it looked like if you applied that risk model to NVIDIA over the last 25 years. Um, in this case, you would have made about three times as much money. Now, obviously, that actually is only a six, is that six? Yeah, about 6% difference in annual return, which comes to something quite substantial over nearly 25 years. But the key thing here is it reduced the drawdown from 90% to 53%. So I think a few years ago, I would have been saying, let's get the go for the big return and if you know just ride through the drawdown but I don't think you need to do that you can see that by some like careful quantitative risk management you can actually reduce the drawdown and increase your overall return in exactly the kind of stocks that we really like like your Transmedics, your NVIDIA, um, the fastest growing companies and the biggest performers so yeah I think these three companies actually really show like our old framework in action you know, Transmedics has the explosive growth. It's one of the top performing stocks, but it's really done that through growing at 133% with like phenomenal unit economics and operating leverage. It's clearly got the true customer love, as does NVIDIA over AMD. But they're really, that's really kind of like a differentiating thing. If, if you're trying to differentiate between AMD and NVIDIA, which one do the customers, you know, really, really like? It's clearly NVIDIA. And then which one do they really have that customer love for? It's really NVIDIA. And which one's growing faster? It's clearly NVIDIA. Um, it also comes back to that idea of winners only. Again, like this framework actually allowed you to choose which one was better. And that's like a really tough decision. That's obviously what everyone's trying to do in the stock market. How do I pick this stock over that stock? And this framework gets the right answer again. And the fourth leg to this is that quantitative risk management piece where you can really see on, particularly on the AMD and NVIDIA, they're very liquid stocks. Um, that have gone through huge, you know, 90% drawdowns and, you know, 300 times returns. You can really see how you can cut that drawdown dramatically and also, you know, actually outperform by applying these simple frameworks. And needless to say, we've had a much better time over the last few years if we were thinking in that way uh, a few years ago. But I guess back then, everything had performed so well that really it was kind of the, like the long-term holders that seemed to be doing best. But on these frameworks, the way we've developed them, you don't actually have to give up that much upside. You know, when we had those like 150% plus years and 100% plus years, these would have kept you in those stocks that entire time, which I think is pretty unique and pretty interesting because they also would have all gave sell signals at the beginning of 2022 um, and missed that kind of like awful kind of three, four months from February to June, which I don't think anybody who was invested at the time is going to forget anytime soon. So... Yeah, I might wrap up there. Four very interesting updates from companies. So some great updates from Clarity, Curvebeam, um, Transmedics, and a fairly weak result from AMD, but fortunately we are out of it, so we can just watch from the sidelines. Hope you found that interesting.